Okay, thank you everyone for coming to the session and Sam, thank you so much for moderating and recording. So um, one thing to point out, I know we're, I'm going to talk about some things and I definitely want to hear your perspectives on things too, but if there's anything that you take away from this, I hope it's the basic idea that science is not a set of facts. It is an iterative process. This is definitely um, confusing. We're told um, one thing, for instance, perhaps um, don't bother with masks, they're not needed. And then we're told research says you must wear face coverings. And that's just really confusing. There's a lot of, it feels like there's a lot of flip flopping. So I think that, um, you know, if you start from this perspective that yes, science is a process, it's, you know, there, it involves careful research, um, scientists reporting data, um, debating each other's findings and um, maybe correcting, resharing, and then updating current understanding as new knowledge comes to light. I feel like that's a little bit um, reassuring to, to know some of the details of how this is done. So a little bit of that is going to be um, covered. I don't want to you know, spend the whole time on that, but um, these are the topics. Um, definitely talk about what sources do we like. We're going to have a little poll where where are you going? Um, where are some useful publications or sources for information about COVID? I will talk a little bit about science communication and source evaluation. And I do want to show you a very nice source for the research um, that I've been appreciating a lot and my researchers have too, but there are so many other things out there. And of course, feel free to type questions and, and comments and whatnot. So just to start out, of course, I'm not a doctor or nurse. Um, so that none of this is health advice. Also, as you well know, this disease just is not very well understood yet. There is a ton of information. In fact, there is a glut of information, more and more coming out all the time, but a lot of it is still being investigated. It's debated very hotly. And a lot of it does tend to be what we call lower level. So it's maybe observational sorts of things um, versus maybe a research study where um, there is an intervention that is performed on, on one group of people, and then you watch two groups of people to see how they do. Um, and of course, expert opinion, that's all we have in some cases. And not to downplay the experts, I depend on them very much. But um, when you think about um, how to um, evaluate information, expert opinion tends to come a little lower down than, say, uh, research studies. Anyway, that's just a caveat. So um, just a quick poll. Um, I'd like to ask everybody, are there sources that you are liking for information about COVID-19? So there's all kinds of different things that you could be interested in, that you could be researching, and whether it's a website, an agency or a group, a publication, um, if you could go to menti.com, you're going to be asked to enter this code 226180 and just type in um, a source or more than one source that you like, and I'll display results up here on the screen. And I'm gonna ask really quick if, um, Sam, are you seeing the results page? Yes. Great, okay. So we're starting to see some results come in, and by the way, you can type more than one answer too. I mean, yes, all in one box, but you can go in and, and add stuff. So yes, I also like um, information that comes out of government agencies a lot. The CDC is huge. North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services um, has both our local information, policy, regulations, what, how things are being done in our state. Oh my gosh, yeah, um, the press releases. Yes, getting into the medical literature searches for sure. That is really nice to actually go and find those primary sources. Democracy Now! experts, I like that one. You know, you have to, you do have to go look at um, policy perspectives on a lot of this stuff that's, that's coming out. Um, Fauci statements. Yes, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Fauci. He keeps it, you know, as nonpartisan and apolitical as you can, um, as possible. So I, I appreciate that deeply. Um, and let's see, also, 
I don't know that I like any of the sources. I mostly listen to the news and read links, which, yeah, that, that makes sense. But I, I definitely would argue that um, news uh, counts, definitely counts as a source. So if anybody is sending you um, news articles, that counts as a source. And, and people that you know, they're for sure sources as well. Oh, somebody's got an in. Somebody works at the COVID hospital in Greensboro, the Green Valley campus. Yeah, I have a friend who, who works at the um, main Cone Health campus and I'm talking with her a lot too to find out what's going on. <laughs> so a lot of great sources here from um, really things that are intended for the general public, you know, that have been um, uh, kind of communicated in a way that um, helps to keep everybody safe to, you know, just the medical literature intended, usually intended for other researchers and scientists. Um, definitely some uh, first hand kind of experiential. I have a friend who works in this hospital. So y'all are, are finding a lot of really good information. Just to um, get a little bit of context about science communication. I know everybody here um, has information on this. You, you definitely have perspectives on this. There are so many different ways that information is communicated. Um, so this, we could have so many slides on this, but just to point out some things um, uh, that are pretty core. Researchers a lot of times like to communicate with each other first so that they can debate each other's work, um, verify the work that's been done, before things start going public. So, you know, obviously going to conferences, um, preprints are becoming a very big deal now. Um, of course, writing up and getting published in peer reviewed journal articles, um, you know, medical specialties and research specialties have their specialty journals. So finding the article for your discipline, your, uh, your specialty is a great thing to do. Um, I would say, you know, things have changed a little bit in the time of COVID-19. So, for instance, um, preprints, which are just preliminary write-ups, um, somebody submits what's basically a rough draft um, to a server, and it's made freely available online. And there are lots of examples, MedArchive, BioArchive. Um, that happens before the peer review process, before the publication process. That's intended to speed up communication. It can take up to a year to get published in, in a peer-reviewed journal. So um, to get information out quickly, there are these preprint servers, which is great, um, but uh, unfortunately it can be easy to misunderstand or misuse that information. Um, for one thing, they are rough drafts, so they don't have a, a lot of the extra information that you might find in a peer-reviewed article. Um, and for another, they, they don't have some of that context. So there are a lot of examples of how things are going wrong with some of these um, different sources. One of the ones that I linked information about on this slide is um, there were some researchers months ago who found that, who reported that um, COVID-19 had about the same fatality rate as the common flu. They published it or they, they posted it in a preprint. Within hours, um, political partisans had found it and had um, disseminated it widely, widely, trying to protest um, stay-at-home measures that were being put in place at that time. Later, it was found that one of the funders of that study was um, actually the founder of JetBlue Airways, who was protesting stay-at-home orders. So you have a really obvious conflict of interest in the funder of the study, plus there were lots of methodological problems. So preprints are great for speeding up information or sharing, but um, they don't have that, that scrutiny that's happened during peer review. And since they're freely available, it is easy to grab a source, completely take it out of context or put it out of context. So they're a little bit dangerous, um, or they can be, I think, um, in terms of, in terms of having an overall picture of um, an understanding of what's going on with a scientific topic. Now, of course, we're, we're all familiar with um, peer-reviewed journal articles, so they're 
you know, you have something that's been through a publication process. Um, uh, you've had an editor and usually multiple peer reviewers have scrutinized um, things like the research methods um, and also how the, the research was communicated, the conclusions that the authors drew, um, what questions remain. Also, really importantly, how does this study or this paper fit in with um, the current understanding, other research that's going on? You know, does it really match up or not? And of course, conflict of interest um, is always a big deal. And, and that is usually going to be examined during the peer review process, peer review and publication process. But you really shouldn't say, oh, this information came out in a peer reviewed journal article. Therefore, we're done. This is the ultimate truth. It is going to stay the same forever. It's, it's just the, um, you know, this is the ultimate answer. For one thing, mistakes can be found, articles can be corrected or retracted as researchers find out about it and um, verify that study with their own studies. Also, um, uh, sorry, things just can come to light. Um, so it is really important to look for independent verification in some way, shape or form. Um, and as consumers of information, it for us, it's usually going to be more finding multiple sources that kind of reflect similar information. So independent verification is good. Press releases, um, we've all seen these, just a promotional blurb. It's meant to advertise something. So maybe a university or a drug company is saying, yay, look at this great research, this great advance, this great drug. That's fantastic. In the past, it was a little more usual for a press release to be issued after the article so that um, the press release might have some, yay, let's all celebrate this wonderful stuff. And here's a citation to a lot more information in case you need it. But um, there's a lot more science by press release now. In other words, press releases being issued before um, information about the research is is made available. So um, I put a link in here and basically it is the uh, a link to Twitter where a researcher gets really angry about science by press release. I just thought that would be fun. The other links in here are a little more informational. I'm gonna, hey, Leah, yeah. um, Marilyn asked, so is the mass study listed here still viable? Excellent question. No, that mask study was retracted. So thanks for asking about that. Sorry. I put that in there because that is an example of a research study that was published in a peer reviewed journal and it was later retracted. It was um, a study that said masks aren't effective. It was based on a really small sample size. And in fact, if you click on the link, um, what I did, the link that I chose to put into my presentation was a page from this blog called Retraction Watch that reports on the study and the problems that were found in it and the fact that it was retracted. I mean, it's a short notice, but um, if, you, if you come upon this study in the wild, um, you might not have all of that context. Um, when a journal article is retracted, there is a notice on the publisher's website, which is nice if you notice it. Um, if you're in a database like PubMed, um, there are retraction notices that are posted and the actual record in PubMed uh, article database for a retracted article will say retracted. But still, it's not always easy to, to recognize that. So retractions are a problem um, for sure. They're not intended to be part of the scientific record. Retraction means there are major problems that were found. Um, but yeah, they're, they're a problem and they happen. Um, Hey, Leah, um, yeah. I have a question. Uh -huh. um, in and you might not know this uh, in terms of like it happened so quickly or whatever, but do you know how often are kind of these uh, peer reviewed research studies, medical research studies retracted? Um, you know, like I, I guess I've never noticed that retraction banner, but I was wondering, like, is, does it happen often? And if so, like, does it happen after the peer review process? Yeah, so um, yeah, retraction 
does actually mean after the peer review process. So retraction means an author has submitted their manuscript to the journal, the editor has eyeballed it and said, this seems to be a pretty good manuscript. I'm gonna share it with peer reviewers and peer reviewers have gone through it. They've marked it up. They've said, yes, with these corrections, this study is good enough to be published in this journal. The article has been published and the retraction means it's already been issued, like officially published. But um, I can give you a pre, I mean, I have a pre, um, kind of pre-COVID answer for your question. Um, and this will take me just a minute. The, um, before the pandemic, retractions were fairly rare. Um, Brainerd did a study of it that looked at, um, I'm so sorry, this is gonna take me a minute, um, that found like out of, 10,000 um, papers that actually were um, or 10,000 papers that were published, only a few were retracted. So retractions aren't actually all, all that common or they weren't. Now, since scientific communication has sped up a lot in, in the last few months, um, all, um, and that's kind of in, in every format, preprints have exploded. Preprint servers have been going over time. There are a lot more of those a lot of journals have um, sped up their publication process. So they've got rapid publication. So things are going in and out at this just breakneck speed. So I think retractions are probably more common than they used to. They used to be really rare. So I don't know if that helps. Um, does anybody have other questions or, or discussion about this? Because this is a huge piece of it, the science communication. And I see a comment, you know, oh no, I thought peer review was to stop this kind of thing from happening. Yes, the, the peer review is, is an additional level of scrutiny. It is intended to catch mistakes, to improve the um, communication in the manuscript, but it's not perfect. Um, and there are all kinds of problems with the peer review process. So that, that um, one of the things that um, a lot of people say uh, researchers, as well as science librarians, they say, don't base your understanding of a topic on one research study. Look at, um, you know, what a lot of different publications are saying. And I know we don't all have time to, to do a lit review for every single question, but if, if it's an important issue, you really should look at multiple sources, um, independent sources, and make sure that um, they're all kind of on the same page about something. I'm going to look back, look at the chats really quick and see how it's going. Right now, there's no other questions. Uh, just some comments that said, this is great and terrifying. And I just said, <laughs> I just said the point. we always say that to our students. True. Okay. So um, in terms of source evaluation, things that we, you know, we definitely say to our students and I'm going to repeat to y'all, um, you know, definitely look for authority um, of the person creating or providing the information, the person or the group. So one, I love to see credentials um, related to the topic. So maybe it's a researcher, maybe it's a doctor, um, but also, you know, maybe it is somebody who has experience and credentials in communicating science information, like a science journalist. They are so valuable right now. It's, they um, do great um, investigation. They do great work in putting context around some of the research that comes out. So um, it's just good when you're looking at a source to think about what is the background of the person or group providing this information. You know, what's their take on this really going to be? Um, and of course, this doesn't guarantee accurate information. I don't know if, um, I mean, I love, I love uh, my authorities and I'm always, you know, going to the CDC, the North Carolina DHHS, the WHO, they're, you know, they're my go-tos, but experts make mistakes and ep experts disagree. I don't know if y'all heard about the, the um, member of the World Health Organization who kind of recently said that there was very little evidence that asymptomatic spread happens with COVID-19. And this is after several months of 
observations and you know other low level kinds of evidence but all kinds of things coming out so i don't i don't know if she had misspoken or or what the deal was but she was in front of a camera and she said that so that started this whole brouhaha so one absolutely absolutely look at the um, authority or experience of the person or group providing the information but don't assume that means that the information itself is correct. Don't do the ad hominem thing. That's just, you know, step one. Do they have the chops for what they're talking about, you know? And of course, other things. Is the information current enough? Um, and that can be a little tricky. <laughs> things change day to day. Um, and of course, can you determine the purpose behind the information source. Is it seem to be intended to inform or is it trying to persuade you of something? Um, is the information, is the source that you're looking at giving you some background about the topic? Is it giving pros and cons or mentioning these questions remain unanswered, pointing those things out to you? Is it giving other points of view or even other sources that you might consult? Um, and of course you wanna do your own verification. If um, your source, uh, if the if the source you're looking at gives another source, go look at it and actually read it. Actually, opening it up and reading it is really important because information can be miscommunicated. We all know about the the telephone game, and of course, as I've been mentioning, find some unrelated independent sources and and see what they have to say about it as well. So um, I. Um, now I'm going to show y'all some, well, there is an example of a resource for COVID-19 that I want to show you, but there is a whole lot of stuff out there and some of it is listed on this library guide. So I will switch gears now. And I'm going to come to the library homepage. Let's see if I can make this a little bigger. And just if we go to the um, free higher ed resources, there is um, a tab for COVID-19 resources. So these are all free resources, which is great. Now I will say that by this point, we are getting publications um, on COVID-19. So, you know, you could go into um, directly to say the PubMed database or to CINAHL, you know, another place um, to look for published articles. But this page that we're looking at now, this guide brings together a lot of free sources. So there are others out there, but this, these are just ones that were pointed out to me or that I found on um, Medlib Twitter. And there's a box at the top that just says, this page links to free sources about the novel coronavirus. Please start with these websites. So for other liaisons in the audience, um, it seems a little weird that I have this page and then this page, this link right here just links to this tab, but this is in case you want to embed this box in a library guide. That's what I do. I embed this box elsewhere and that brings people over to these free sources. And the, the start here, um, just to give you orientation to the page, the, the start here links are things like the CDC. There's a really nice basic um, explainer on COVID-19 from Brown and MIT and a few other sources. And of course we've got, I love the North Carolina DHHS, we've got them, World Health Organization, Johns Hopkins dashboard. Um, the one that I wanna show you in just a minute is called Lit COVID. It's, it's a really nice source that pulls from PubMed. It doesn't have preprints. So if you're interested in searching a lot of different places for preliminary reports, um, this COVID-19 is a nice federated meta search that also includes preprints. Lit COVID is just published articles. But just so you can see a few of the other things on here, there are a lot of professional organizations, agencies, um, different groups trying to step up and make information that they have to contribute freely available. So definitely people like the American College Health Association. We all work in a university, so we might want to see the latest updates and alerts on colleges at this time. Um, and there are a lot of, a lot of others. Um, you know, like a, these folks have a field guide for people working in emergency medicine. There's um, ASTM uh, that provide, that is a standards making organization. They're making standards for actual masks freely available. So anybody who wants to 
kind of MacGyver up their, their masks and do that. But anyway, these are all, they're alphabetical order by provider, but there are a lot of, um, a lot of groups out there providing information. But, um, oh, does anybody have any questions about the guide before I open up Lit COVID? Not right now. So okay. Susan just asked a question. Are there any quality controls at all for preprints that are universal? Does the quality vary by server? Are there some servers that publish more dubious preprints? Ah, that's a, those are good questions. Okay. There are there are some basic quality controls for preprints. Um, I will, but, but they do vary by server. Um, I will find a good summary for you um, that talks about this is what we do at, for instance, BioArchive and MedArchive. Um, they do intentionally um, try to uh, verify just some very, very basic things. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting read, but it'll take me a minute or two to find those. That's, that's a good point, Susan. Um, and a good question. I'll have to follow up with that. Yeah, no, good. Excellent information. Um, and I have that somewhere. <laughs> so lit COVID, this is a freely available source. So you could just Google the name lit COVID and get to this. You don't have to go through all this clicking that I went through but it is a curated hub of free literature on COVID-19 from the PubMed database. So it can be browsed. You'll notice that um, they're pulling a ton of articles and they're um, categorizing them. So you could just click into, oh, I wanna see some general articles on COVID-19. And you can see they just um, list them here. You get a title, you get, um, the journal title and you can click into it for full text and you can see this was yesterday that this was put in so a lot of stuff here you could general prevention whatever you can also um, search it as well so i was going to let me see i was going to show a search for disparity Oh, and yes, obviously there are filters on the side. Let me make this a little bigger. Okay, so health disparity and um, so it finds a whole bunch of results. You can see the number up here. Um, if I like the looks of this one, uh, examining social determinants of health, I can click into it. And I could click right into the full text, or I could click over into similar publications. And again, we get the title. Um, I know it's a little hidden over here, but we get authors and journal title underneath the article title, and then a link out to full text. Sorry, that's super brief. But <laughs> again, yes, they, and there are certainly filters, including um, geographic area so we could go health disparities in the United States and you can um, it recognizes and and or and quotes so um, and complication you could do health disparity and complication some of the same things will come up again because they're going to include all of these ideas um, but you'll see there should be fewer results and and it kind of zooms in a little bit I don't know, this is my big exciting. And here we get the world map, which is very exciting. Weekly publications. Um, one of the really interesting things about this resource, I think, is that they start with a, the, the first iteration of gathering sources into this site is, um, is basically done by machine, which is really, really cool. Where's the FAQ? Where's the FAQ? Aha, here it is. The first round of getting literature in here is it's it's basically using artificial intelligence to to get articles in here. And then they have people actually um, looking over the results and assigning them categories. So 
I don't know, are there any questions about this source? And there are other things we could look at here or? People might be typing in. Okay. Um, Anna has to go to another meeting, so she said thank you. She'll watch the recording to catch the end. <laughs> great. And, um, this is so great. Um, and I put a link to um, late COVID in the chat so that we'll have it. I'll put a link to your um, presentation again. Does anyone have any questions beyond that or comments? It looks like you're good, Leah. Looks like I'm good. Okay. Well, I've been I've been talking a lot about the preprint, so I want to um, quickly show a search that includes some preprints. I think this is a really cool source. So, and again, I know we've got a lot of the coves and the covids and the, all these names, but um, this is a slightly different source to find scholarly um, reports called the COVID nineteen portfolio. This is another freely available source. I have it bookmarked on here. Um, so expert curated source for publications and preprints. So it pulls publications from PubMed, but it also pulls from the preprint servers that you see listed. And I tried to make that bigger so that you can see it. And then of course I hit it. So it includes preprints that relate to COVID-19 from um, all these preprint servers. So if I'm looking for bleeding edge scholarly stuff, um, then I can type a topic in and there are lots of filters hidden under here, which is really cool. You can see that re results, um, each row, it's um, the default sort is by date. So day by day, it will give you results. And this is what came up. We see COVID-19 and racial ethnic disparities. If you want to um, actually see the description and then the full text, you click on this number. And I'm sorry, this is so tiny. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. And before I, there's the, this is kind of fun. I've got my screen totally resized for this. So uh, there we go. I'm just going to scroll over so you can see in the list. Um, of course, there's a, a number that leads to the full text. There's a title, there's a, a posting or publication dates. And then on the other end of this grid, you see, is this the latest version of this? Where is this coming from? A, either PubMed or one of the preprint servers. What's the journal name? And if we decide we want to look at this one, just click into the number. We'll get a little information here. I get the authors. Sometimes there are abstracts in there too. And there usually is going to be a full text at the bottom. But of course, I am. I've resized everything so much. Bibliometrics journal, full and full text. Make everything tiny again. And similar records link. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to promise that these are here in full text <laughs> or they're linked in full text um, because they have been when I've been using this source in the past. Sorry about this. This happens. Um, click to another. Well, okay it found it. That's not very helpful in terms of a process. I don't want anybody else to go through that process. <laughs> I'm going 
going to say COVID portfolio. What a fantastic place. If you see something you like, click on the number. And this is where I usually look, bottom of the description for the full text. Obviously, there are other links too that you don't want to try and find during a presentation. Any questions about this one? Not so far. Okay. So I'm going to bring this back around because um, probably we don't want to watch the, the librarian go, hmm, you know, over the glasses and, and all that. So like COVID is the example that I prepared, but just to kind of summarize, um, there's a lot that's still unknown about this disease. Research, verification of research, and other things related to scientific communication are still going on. So, and they're always going on actually. So remember to evaluate your sources and use more than one source. And um, try not to get whiplash when you, <laughs> when you read um, one thing, face coverings don't help or face masks don't help one day. And then perhaps a week or a month later, you're told everyone must wear face coverings. Just, you know, try to remember, don't base it on just one study. Things do change. Um, scientific process still keeps going even if the current understanding changes. And that's all I got. Great. I can personally say, while people are putting comments and questions in the chat, that this was really useful for me. I immediately bookmarked COVID hmm. and will be telling all my friends about it. Yay! <laughs> so people are saying, um, yes, thanks. Thank you. This is helpful. Does anyone have any questions for Leah? Um, Want to talk through any of this? Uh, yeah, Susan comments, this is such good info. I agree. I think you might have said this, but just to, for me to like hear it again. Um, so lit COVID is, you know, kind of uh, an in, NIH and CMI product, right? So does it, is it only open access articles or would you be um, kind of pushed into paywalls or have non-access to some things as well? It is supposed to be only open access articles. I have not, I, and I haven't run into a paywall thing yet, but that's how it's intended. That's how it's set up. I mean, you don't even see um, the kind of link out to full text, link resolver types of things that you usually uh, see. Um, it, for instance, in PubMed, which is freely searchable database, but the full text, a lot of times you have to go through your university. So. It should be everything free. And, and um, Susan did ask, um, I'm so confused about what they know for sure resurfaces gloves. Do you know the consensus as it stands now? Is it hard to catch from touching surfaces? That is a good question. Um, so I would certainly need to research that <laughs> to, to just to, you know, hear um, what folks are saying. I, in terms of information, what I would do for information gathering is I would start with not necessarily the peer reviewed research articles. I would start with the summaries that are intended for public consumption, like say from the CDC. Yes, Rachel, you make a really good point. So. Rachel pointed out that I've heard also it's airborne, which is scary re regarding ventilation systems. So um, remember what I said, you, you do want to find multiple sources. Um, and also the thing is the current, the understanding is changing. So there was, I don't know, I heard about an open letter that a lot of scientists recently wrote to the World Health Organization getting after WHO for not um, being more open about the fact that airborne could be a mechanism. So um, there, this, that hasn't been established yet. It hasn't been established that airborne is not a mechanism. It hasn't been, a lot of these things um, just haven't 
been disproven or um, the specifics of them have not yet been proven that I know of. I'm just going to say it like that. So yeah, I am, I am very troubled myself um, because I love, I love facts. I love to have something concrete to kind of hang my hat on. The, IML, the IMLS research, I found that very reassuring. You know, how long does the virus tend to live on um, materials such as books? I loved being able to look at research that showed that. And it's distressing to me that there, that there are possible mechanisms and who knows how big a part they play. Um, I'm kind of freaked out about being in a closed building with recirculated air. That, that, that gives me the Wiggins. Oh yeah. Hmm. Yes. Hmm. I see some other, some other comments and questions on this. <sighs> yeah, I think I think it, it is a little troubling that some of the science and some of the policy and the public health response that some of that is being politicized. Um, it, it just is. Um, and, and that's scary. That has scary implications. But, you know, if you, if you look back at, for instance, what people were doing and what was happening during the big um, flu pandemic or epidemic uh, pandemic of 1918, 1919, people were fighting masks then too. People were doing all kinds of things. So I also see a question, thoughts on the Realm project. Sorry, I'm not familiar with that. Maybe I should be, I do not know. So I'd love to address that. But if you wanna put that on my radar, do you wanna mention a little bit more? Okay. So there, there is now a link in chat to, ah, no, stop it, stop it. Systematic literature review. And I'm sorry, I know my camera's on, so y'all are gonna see me zooming in and out, like my face is gonna do wacky things. So I haven't seen this before. The, the systematic review on reopening libraries and archives. So I can't, I can't really comment specifically on it. I will say in general, as, as a health sciences librarian, I like seeing systematic review. It makes me think that somebody went in and looked at a lot of different research studies and maybe they tried to synthesize um, what was going on. So to me, that's a higher level of evidence. It's, it's better to look at that kind of evidence versus um, just a single research study. But um, I don't know, my personal opinion about reopening things, I, I don't think it's safe right now. Um, I'm a little shocked at, at some of the reopening stuff that's going on. And I'm worried about us, all of us. Thank you for sharing that link, I appreciate it. So, uh, I don't know if Sam wants to stop recording. We could really let it hang out <laughs> after this. It's not like, I haven't exactly been holding it in before now, but you know. Ah, somebody else has to go, okay. I think it's fine to let it out, but I will stop recording unless, so if people wanna uh, let it out more, that's totally fine. 